and welcome to Pilot Day on This Movie Exists, where we are dropping three episodes all at once, covering three very different types of movie with just a little bit of stylistic difference because we're testing to see how they perform and what kind of material people react most strongly to. Links to the other two episodes will be in the description and at the end card. Please watch all three when you can. Like, subscribe, and tell your friends. We need the feedback, and we really need the money. So why cover these three movies, or at least why this movie? Well, before looking into the development of new online content, what often stands out as solid advice is that one should stay away from divisiveness or controversy early on. Build your brand out first, establish the trust relationship with the audience before moving into areas that might be off-putting or uncomfortable, like discussing politics, religion, international relations, or anything that could be tied to currently controversial, ongoing geopolitical events. Oh, and also, for movies specifically, it's probably a good idea to keep things relatable to what's bound to be a mostly Gen X and younger millennial audience, given YouTube and other platforms' demographic data. At least at first, you want to stay within the temporal and cultural experiential zone of a hypothetical viewer for whom classics might now refer to movies made in the early 2000s, and a really old movie might refer to, say, the original Star Wars or, hell, the first Shrek. So obviously, what makes more sense than covering a black-and-white movie from 1935 about a religious war in Jerusalem? <coughs> Okay, so The Crusades is technically only about one of the Crusades, the third one, with Richard the Lionheart, and as in the modern age, among the less-remembered sound-era historical epics from Cecil B. DeMille, who I think is probably one of the last old-time Hollywood director names people know, even if they can't name one of his movies or really describe why they're supposed to know who he was. I mean, they probably maybe know, like, the last couple movies because they get referenced, but that's probably about it, right? For Especially for Generation Z and younger. All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. All right, Mr. DeVille, I'm ready for my close-up. I'm ready for my close-up, Mr. DeVille. I'm ready for my close-up, Mr. DeVille. Unless this series completely bombs, or I get a much better, more time-consuming job offer than anything else I currently have happening, so let's see what happens there. I imagine we'll speak more on him in the future, but in quick order, DeMille is largely remembered as early American cinema's go-to epic spectacle guy, at least in terms of epic spectacle guys who survived the apocalyptic transition from the silent era where he was already prodigious. There were three young directors who showed promise in those days. D.W. Griffith, Cecil B. DeMille, and Max von Meyerling to the sound age, largely because while DeMille was very good at throwing big, big, big set pieces on screen, where he excelled equally was getting the audience to connect with epic visual spectacles by pairing them with epic emotional spectacle. In fact, a lot of his movies aren't epics. He also did westerns, period dramas, marriage comedies, thrillers, bedroom farces, opera, and even theater adaptations. What they all had in common was big, showy, make sure the people in the back rows can tell what everyone is feeling approach to characters and visuals inspired by Renaissance lighting and the paintings of Gustave Doré. live by the law! Christian martyrs, torn by the beasts of the jungle, before the inhuman beasts of Rome. You gotta remember, when people talk about cinematic innovation for the guys who started out making movies in the 1910s or 20s like DeMille did, it's not like today where that means upgrading camera technology, or new animation rendering, or bullet time. We're talking about people having to invent film storytelling out of nothing. Stuff you just take for granted now, like show the outside of a whole building, then show the inside of a room, but play the same ambient sound or music, or people talking over both shots and everyone will know, oh, that's the inside of that building. Or if you show a guy looking and then you cut to a thing from a different angle, it means he's looking at the thing. Yet yeah, those very basic rules of visual storytelling just didn't exist for James Nguyen to eventually ignore. Someone had to think them up. What's going on? Can they get in? We need something to protect ourselves. DeMille did not think up anything that groundbreaking. His contributions were more on the saucy side, the get butts in seats and keep them there side, but he was coming up in that very milieu. DeMille came from a theater and acting background, but what really fired him up was art, music, and design more than dialogue or coherency of narrative. He trusted screenwriters to deliver on dialogue, motivation, and plots after he and his visual teams worked out the idea of a story in visuals and tone based on elaborate sketches and art concepts dictating general narrative direction and big sweeps of emotion meant to be conveyed to the audience. This is the setting. This is the sad part. This is what people should be feeling here to here, and here's how we get there. Action! And I mean circus-grade action! Would you show a little emotion? 
people, people, please, just because it's a dramatic scene doesn't mean you can't do a little comedy in the background. Throw a pie at two, for God's sake. And when it came to those ideas of story, what he understood to the point of almost absurdity was the same thing that gothic romance, paperback fiction, and pulp magazines always would. That visual spectacle was big and sweeping, while emotional spectacle was lurid and personal. So DeMille movies at any scale or scope of story are generally going to get the stakes down to sexy people and intensely soapy emotional conflict. Sign of the Cross boils the whole complex intergenerational history of Roman emperors, including Nero, using public persecution of early Christianity in the Colosseum as a bread and circus distraction from imperial political turmoil to specifically a handsome centurion who's torn between his lust for sexy pagan Roman girls, but also sexy just in a different way, pious Christian girl who he should be feeding to some lions, except, you know, everybody's just so sexy and jealous. Madam Satan is a musical and a disaster movie set on a zeppelin that eventually crashes, but it's all happening because this dude's wife and his mistress are fighting over him at a costume party. The Ten Commandments, DeMille's last and best known to to modern viewers movies takes the entire book of Exodus where there's already a lot going on and says yeah this, this should really be a horny bodice ripper with brother against brother for the surrogate love of a father and a woman who comes between them thing happening. Is that what you want? To be a slave? Then why aren't you kneeling at the feet of a princess? This man makes himself a god. I prefer him as a man. Bring it back to me. Stained with his blood. Oh Moses. All the chicks have big naturals, Moses and Pharaoh are both good looking and the mid-50s version of Ripped, and even later when Moses is a wizard, you can tell this wizard still lifts. Man shall be ruled by law, not by the will of other men. You have not obeyed the Lord. Behold his mighty hand. And you know he also did a Cleopatra movie and a Samson and Delilah movie, those are kind of more self-explanatory. Even his circus movie is full of romance and melodrama and they crash a train because even the circus doesn't have enough circus. I know writers who use subtext and they're all cowards. Speaking of the Ten Commandments though, just to circle back and get back on track, apocryphally, though there is a lot of soundstage work on that movie and basically zero Egyptians in the cast are even Jews, which is interesting. They did shoot a bunch of that movie in Egypt, which was a big deal even in 1957, because things were already kind of going to shit for U.S. Mideast relations at that point, and the Egyptian government was not allowing every Western movie company to come and set up around their stuff anymore, but DeMille, not exactly known as Hollywood's most progressive or globally open-minded guy, kind of the opposite, I know you're shocked. It's hard to explain this to a young person, but people of my generation are, you know... Racist. That's it! was supposedly able to secure a pass with very little issue because the people making that decision in Egypt thought he was A-OK. -okay. Uh, specifically because of his respectful portrayal, relative to the overall history of Western movies otherwise, one must assume, of Arab and Muslim characters in his movie The Crusades from 1935. Do I believe that story? I mean, maybe? So anyway, about that movie, at last, The Crusades was DeMille visually still figuring out epic scale action visuals for the sound era, along with the rest of Hollywood, but already hitting his narrative bullseyes with the character stuff, taking a blowtorch and pliers to anything resembling the actual history of the Third Crusade, and carving it into a crowd-pleasing melodrama by way of who's a good guy, who's a bad guy, who's horny and for whom, and if we've got to be pious for the censors now, then for fuck's sake, find me some backstabbing and skullduggery to get naughty about. I said this is a talkie, damn it! You've got to emote more! And you extras, wave your arms and make faces! What is this, a morg? And what he and his crew landed on was the two basic facts that every schoolboy used to know about the Third Crusade. That King Richard and Saladin, the leader of the Muslim army and eventually Sultan of Egypt and Syria, eventually came to an honorable, if temporary, peace term at the Treaty of Jaffa, and that this is supposed to be the same King Richard from the Robin Hood story, so the English royal stuff can be super fucked up in the background. And also, there's not a ton of extra detail about any of these people's lives otherwise in history, so otherwise he could do whatever he wanted as far as he was concerned. Is there any way, I mean, can we add like a topless scene or something? Uh, yeah. Really? Yeah. We can? Oh, great. All right, we got a movie. So we open with Saladin and the Saracens taking Jerusalem, presumably around 1187. A holy Christian hermit announces he'll head to Europe and marshal up the Crusades. Hearken to me, unbeliever, foe of Christ. Oh, Break oh, him down! down. No. Let him speak. You have conquered. The Holy Land is yours. 
but never will you conquer this. I go to all the kings in Christendom. A mighty host shall arise. Go, Hermit. Carry your thunder across the sea. Tell your Christian kings what you have seen. Kind of collapsing the different crusades of a few different centuries into just one stew here, but we've got a story to get to, so fine. Woe to you, unbeliever. I go to preach the great crusade. <laughs> Specifically, the story of why King Richard of England, our hero for the peace, decides to go fight in a war that is not his or his country's, when even DeMille knows that a guy just being super into Bible stuff is a boring as shit motivation, and in the real world we're still six years away from Pearl Harbor, so another foreign war is not on American viewers' let's go do that relatability radar yet. So instead, they settle on, what if a dude just wants to party? Oh, Richard ruled in England, the devil reigned in hell. I vote for mighty monarchs who govern passing well. Till Richard went to Hades, the devil a visit to pay, and with his fire and brimstone, poor Satan ran away. And broke his pitchfork too. Our king, he lifts his cup on high. Yeah, so this movie's version of Richard I of England is a hard-drinking guy who just wants to hang out with his boys and do fun medieval night shit, but he's about to lose some or all of that cool kingly freedom because he's betrothed to marry Princess of France, who's... What's the matter, Robert? Have you seen a ghost? I've seen the King of France. Does my saintly cousin come in peace or war? He comes in peace. And he brings his royal sister. Oh, Alice. Well, she's no dove with an olive branch. Uh, I mean, you know, she's kind of hot, but basically he doesn't want to get married because even for the king, that means no more fun. You cannot escape this marriage. Now, what do I care for France? Fighting. Always fighting. Fearing no devil and praying to no god. Well, why should I? I know my horse, Fogel. I know the feel of a lance in my hand. I know what it is to see men go down before me. Now, look. This sword's being made for me. No other arm shall wield it but mine. With this sword, Robert, I'll swing a stroke from Norway down to Spain. Why should I fear and pray for what I don't understand? <clears throat> Since nobody can say I don't know my audience, those of you who'd like to pause and message that one guy from your D&D &D group and let them know you just discovered their favorite movie that they haven't seen yet, go ahead and do that right now. Yeah, I thought so. Oh, and uh, also, Princess Alice, the French, and Richard's brother John are probably conspiring to either kill or otherwise dethrone him. Because this is really all about France and the rest of Europe taking over England and consolidating because England is maybe sort of standing in for quasi-wait-and-see isolationist pre-World War II America here. What of Richard? Richard of England? With you away? We'll take France. Is that what you try to say, Conrad of Montferrat? Quite. Richard is betrothed to my sister Alice. And with Alice, Queen of England, the English lion will be caged. Happiness, Richard, in your marriage to my sister. <laughs> I've no wine left, Philip. I can't drink that toast. It's not fully clear that Richard really grocks that. He literally just doesn't want her to make him stay home and do king stuff instead of hanging out with the guys. Anyway, the hermit shows up looking for crusaders and Richard realizes that the whole forsaking all bonds thing. Now shall the son depart from the father and the husband from the wife. Many who go shall not return. Therefore, all other earthly promises and vows are wiped away. Means that if he joins the crusade, it'll void his arranged marriage. So Richard says, fuck you, anyone who says I can't act strategically, and joins the crusades. Will you join the crusade, forsaking all else? Yes, I will renounce everything. Even the lovely woman to whom I'm pledged. And DeMille says, fuck you, anyone who says symbolism and metaphor has to be subtle, and pulls this shtick with the swords into crucifixes. 
Let God's blessing be upon these swords. So Richard gets to crusading, and this is where we get our big soapy melodrama storyline. On the way to the Holy Land, Richard, who has zero intention of doing anything holy other than kicking ass and not being married, manages to look bad by being himself in front of a pious Christian hottie named Berengaria. That can't be Richard. Oh yes, that's Richard. I hope he starves. Shortly thereafter, he finds out that he has to do another marriage arrangement to get food and passage for his troops, but this time no one's gonna make him do anything. He just has to promise to take whoever this princess is off daddy's hands, so he's like, sure, I loopholed this shit once already, and even sends his sword to play his part at the wedding, because I guess that's actually something medieval kings could do, or we think they could do at this point, and it's easy to imagine DeMille hearing about this and going, oh, fuck, yeah, that's cool as shit, put that in, we can totally use that. Wilt thou, Berengaria, have this man to thy husband? To love him, obey him, worship him. In nomine Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. What token shall I take Richard? Tomorrow. Right on. As you wish, my lady. I wonder who she is. Your wife? What? Berengaria, your wife, you married her last night. Oh, why the devil didn't you tell me she looked like that? Awkward. And, uh, wow, yeah, they went right there with the sword thing, didn't they? Look here, I'm your husband. You're not. This is my husband. This is what I married. For goodness sake, be reasonable. My husband will protect me. And there's your pious redemption arc DeMille style. Richard will have to liberate the Holy Land and get right with Jesus if he wants to get right up in there. Oh, but also back home in England, his brother Prince John has usurped the throne in order to kick off the plot of Robin Hood and a bunch of other movies. My brother? Who brings you such report? Tell this lion of ours the news from England. Ashamed of your king, Prince John? Yes. John offers to make Alice Queen of England. Richard, you must make your choice. She was sold for cattle. I am land and power. Wow, this is a good movie! So when Richard tells the King of France he's definitely not marrying Princess Alice and Berengaria will be Queen of England instead, all the other kings just get pissed at him and start plotting to kill him and work with John and the King of France instead. Renounce this woman, or France withdraws from the crusade! The Lord of France, you must not. Master of France! France must not withdraw! Oh, like your men! Fire! No, no, my lord! France must remain! The Philippines! France and England are the two arms of the crusade! I will not fight beside him. Don't let him withdraw from the crusade! Make peace with France! This will end the crusade. Give her up. I swear to you, Berengaria, that this sword will enter Jerusalem and rest on the tomb. And if that is not done, may it stand between us as man and wife forever. <laughs> Amen. Except for Saladin, and I guess this is where you can see where the Egyptians were coming from, reveals himself pretty early on as much less the villain or even antagonist here, and more of a guy who knows he already won at the beginning of the movie and spends the rest of it in a mode of, okay, you know what? This is interesting. I'm gonna hang back and see how this plays out. Who speaks? Richard of England. The Lion King. We are many kings. There is room in Asia to bury all of you. Insolent! Posting and wine go well together. Ho oh, there! Bring wine for the infidel! We of the true faith drink no wine. You refuse me? Not you, my noble enemy. I refuse the wine. Well, we'll drink water then. They told me I had horns like the devil. I think he's magnificent. If I die here, at least I'll take you with me and my men will fill hell with your infidels. By Allah, I wish you might have been my brother, not my foe. Which ends up meaning Berengaria, thinking that she herself is causing all the turmoil, runs away into danger, ultimately winds up under Saladin's care in Jerusalem. And hey, they get along too. How about that? Who saw that coming? Master, we must try down. We must go. Allah has sent her to me. I will not let her die. Here is peace by the holy city of Jerusalem. I carried you here in my arms, and I prayed to Allah that you would live. 
Well, the Crusaders didn't see that coming, so they mount up under Richard to attack Jerusalem so we can get the big gnarly battles that this whole premise promised, and yeah, especially for 1935, this was big stuff. Sound the call to arms. <laughs> Pretty much all the medieval movies made after this, and then for a long time going forward until they found new ways to do it in the 50s and 60s, were working off techniques this movie established, and it looks pretty damn cool today still. <laughs> a straight line from certain shots in this to everything from Lord of the Rings to Ironclad. It still looks really good. I mean, it holds up. Like, the stuff that this movie gets wrong about medieval combat, we're still getting wrong today. Plot-wise, it's also the chance the bad kings have been waiting for to take Richard out, specifically Conrad of Montferrat, acting in league with Prince John and the French to have him followed by assassin knights who will eventually turn on him while Conrad goes to secure a deal with Saladin. Victory is not sure while Richard of England lives. You're his brother's friend. And would be yours. What price do you ask for your treachery? The kingdom of Jerusalem, which I shall rule under you. And what do you offer me? Richard's death. Within the hour, he will lie on the battlefield among the slain. Who would slay your lion of the Crusades? <laughs> Fifteen swords of mine follow him where he goes alone. And what message do you bring me now? Your death. Ask him! Kill him! Oh. Take him in the back! Get that sword! Stop my mouth! Oh! Pull it down! Action! Take this sword! Back! Uh, one, one problem with that plan, though, Conrad. I have no traffic with assassins. Yeah. Away with this dog. <laughs> oh, shit. Okay, yeah, now, now you see how much better this looks versus every other portrayal of Muslims and Arabs in movies from the 30s and 40s. Yep, okay, all right, yeah, I get it. My Lord Sultan, you can save him. How is it that Saracens come to the aid of the English king? And it sets up our actual denouement, which is not a battle, but a negotiation. Richard and Saladin hammer out a treaty for Muslims and Christians to free each other's captives, share access to Jerusalem's holy sites, and end the war with a caveat of Richard never entering the city himself, and Berengaria remaining with Saladin because the dude's gotta learn some kind of lesson. No, Saladin healed me, cared for me. You owe your own life to him. To Saladin? She promised herself to me to save your life. I'll not accept my life at that price! We've been blind. We were proud, dearest, when we took the call. And in our pride, we fought to conquer Jerusalem. We tried to ride through blood to the holy place of God. But now... Now we suffer. The holy city of Allah. Oh, what if we call him Allah or God? Shall men fight because they travel different roads to him? Yeah, I know, right? I remind you, this movie is from 1935. Richard, you hold a piece of the world in your hand. What does it matter what happens to us? If men can live and the holy city be freed. Baron Geria, you know what you ask. Yes. Your terms are granted. It stands between us as man and wife. Forever.
or not, because Saladin apparently decides free the captives means all the captives, and I'm already the coolest guy in this movie. Saladin bade me tell you, all captives shall be freed. It will not hold me without love. And plus, you know, 70 years later, Lord of the Rings is going to have to borrow this Pieta with shattered sword visual from somewhere. Yeah, how about that? Again, it's like poetry, it's sort of they rhyme. Mm -hmm. Every stanza kind of rhymes with the last one. And that's The Crusades, yeah, from 1935, a movie that has really about as much to do with actual history as The Crusades themselves had to do with anybody's religious convictions, which is to say, not much, but it sure was influential. Let me touch it. Let me touch the wood of the cross before I die. Praise to the Lord our God. It is true. The cross on which he died. No, he's with us always. And boy, you're badly hurt. I'm dying. But I've touched the cross. Go, my king. Lay your hand on it. Yes, 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 yes. Comedy. Uh, so that was uh, Ian Keith as Saladin, by the way. Really great journeyman character actor from his generation who pretty much always had a part in DeMille's company of players if he wanted it, and uh, Loretta Young was basically top build here as Berengaria. She was a name already having been a child actress in The Silence and a pre-code star and stuff like Born to be Bad and Too Young to Marry before becoming one of the biggest stars of the 40s when she was doing multiple films a year and then kept working well into the 90s, even transitioning to TV host stardom in the 60s and 70s. Alice, the bad princess, was Catherine DeMille, the director's own adopted daughter, also acted in a bunch of films herself for him and otherwise. Richard's sidekick, of course, was Alan Hale Sr., one of the great, if not the greatest, that guy sidekick supporting actor who ever lived. You've seen him do this type of role dozens of times, most famously as Little John in the Errol Flynn Robin Hood. He, of course, is also the father of the skipper Alan Hale Jr., and the inventor of the hand fire extinguisher and the greaseless potato chip. No, fucking really, go look that up. Tomorrow we fight again. What's left of us? And Henry Wilcoxon, another DeMille regular, was King Richard. Uh, if that, I bet that dude was a boxer before he was an actor. Pre-1950s, tough guy face looks familiar at all to you, and you were an 80s kid like me. You're not gonna believe where you know him from. I keep playing. I don't think the heavy stuff's gonna come down for quite a while. You're right. Anyway, the good Lord would never disrupt the best game of my life! <laughs> Yeah, that's Bishop Pickering from Caddyshack. How fucking great is that? You're not a man, you're a bishop, for God's sakes! There is no God. And that's the Crusades, yeah. It's not the best thing anyone involved ever did, but it's a lot of fun. And as entertaining, if awkward movies from way back go, it feels like one people don't talk about or even know about as much as they ought to. Obviously, the most interesting aspects are how much nuance and character depth are afforded to Saladin and the concept of Muslim characters in a Crusades movie being three-dimensional human beings, even as the plot still ultimately turns on a fabricated abduction and almost forced marriage storyline, so that's not great. You are no longer the wife of the Lion King. What do you mean? Islam does not accept a Christian marriage. Oh. Versus the kings of Christendom being depicted as petty squabbling dipshits and eventually the message to all of them is the concept of religious war for different iterations of the same god being dumb. But you know, this time through what stuck out for me was how compelling a lead Richard manages to be considering how much of the story commits to him otherwise as a quintessential asshole protagonist almost the entire time. Part of it is that there's a lot of show-don't-tell going on and the only thing that's supposed to explain why everyone puts up with this guy is the idea that he's this total badass man of action, the lion-hearted on the battlefield. So they really have no option but to make Richard the rare, blustery, bragging, bullheaded windbag character where it turns out his mouth was writing checks that his fists could cash. <laughs> Uh, Wilcoxon is a really solid action star here, and in the context of 1930s stunt work and staging, they really make you buy it when this guy says, I'm gonna go one-man army my way into Jerusalem, and the rest of the Crusaders say, yeah, you know, I'm thinking we got a shot here. This is, uh, this is the horse I'm betting on. Send the call to arms. We go on to Jerusalem. My horse! You cannot, Richard. Thousands lie dead outside the walls. I ride to Jerusalem. 
Let's follow me who will. Uh, whatever else may be said of it, this movie exists. Uh, so hey guys, I hope you all enjoyed this presentation of This Movie Exists. Since it's pilot day, we're launching three back-to-back-to-back -back -back debuts all at once, so please check out the other two showing right now, and remember to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching.